Okay, so picking up from where I did on the data subjects, um, I'm really going to get heavily into criticizing this entire Facebook model here, okay? So, Evgeny Morozov, uh, who's writing actually a fair bit of time ago now, but his criticisms are still very pertinent, writing in 2011, very, very critical of Facebook and the model, not just Facebook model, but also Google's model as well and other companies with the same kind of business model, right? Optimism around social media is based on techno-deterministic ideologies of cyber utopianism. That's a hell of a sentence. That only postulate advantages for businesses and society through the lens of that industry um, without the ben and the benefits to that industry without taking into account the realities of exploitation and the contradictions of capitalism. And what Morozov is really saying here is all the advocates for Facebook's business model are people like Facebook. You know, they don't take into account the wider impacts of this business model on society. And I guess if we combine that with some of the insights into, you know, uh, democratic issues around elections and referenda, for example, to start to see what the societal problems are, which aren't really included in any analysis of the economic model by those companies. Jose Van Dijk really makes similar points that social media achieves this through an automation of the social by engineering and manipulating social connections between people. Doug Rushkoff argues this is a result of social media is involved in a process of optimizing humans for machinery, making us more predictable and easier to control, making us optimized to be more like machines and to be used. I mean, Christian Fuchs book, um, th this is from the first edition of uh, Social Media Critical Introduction. The third edition will be long pretty soon, but probably not in time for this module. Uh, Fuchs summarizes, though, very handily why this is so problematic. Facebook is a company controlled by private shareholders who own that platform. Facebook's users create data whenever they're online that refers to their profiles and online behavior, right? Okay, we know this. This is the digital oil, right? This data is sold to Facebook's advertising clients who are enabled to present targeted advertisement on our profiles. So without the users, there's no profit. Without us, there is nothing to sell. So users create the monetary value and profit of Facebook. Do they, <coughs> excuse me, they do not own this profit at all, which is controlled by the shareholder. So Facebook users are therefore exploited. We are given nothing for the value that we produce for that company. Indeed, social media consumers are double objects of commodification. They are commodities themselves. We are a commodity. And through this commodification of their consciousness as embodied through their activity, uh, they become while online permanently exposed to commodity logic in the form of ad advertisements. So we are both a commodity and we are sold other commodities all the time while we're online. It's just pure commodification of everything that goes on. And we are trapped in this. In terms of surveillance and privacy, of course, things get much, much darker. The privacy of individuals using these platforms is a root cause of much of the consternation about the wider influence of these companies and Facebook in particular. So Helen Niesbaum's, uh, Niesenbaum's work sorry, so, um, is really, really pivotal in this. And I summarise some parts of it here. Argues that the right to privacy is neither a right to secrecy nor a right to control, but a right to appropriate flow of personal information. And Niesenbaum's argument is that that does no longer exist. We don't control our own information. It flows away from us and we have no mechanism to reclaim control. So surveillance on Facebook is surveillance of prosumers, those who create and consume, who dynamically and permanently create and share user-generated content, browse profiles and data, interact with others, join, create and build communities, and co-create information. These are the basic things that we do on any social media platform, and we are therefore being surveilled constantly in these activities. Now for Hannah Arendt, uh, in terms of privacy, Facebook is a typical manifestation of a stage of capitalism in which the relation of public and private and labor and play collapses in together, and which this collapse is then exploited by capitalism. So the distinction between the private and the public realms equals the distinction between things that should be shown and things that should not be hidden for Hannah Arendt. But what we're arguing here is that this has been collapsed totally. Private and public have been pulled right together by the use of these platforms. What we do in private is now surveilled just as much as what we do in public. So Facebook monitors, commodifies and uses all private data and user behavior. 
whereas the users do not know exactly what happens with their data and to whom these data are sold for the task of targeted advertising. We have no say in that. We have no visibility of that. We don't know how it works. We don't know how it happens. We don't know how people get hold of our us as the data subject. So Facebook usage's private dimension is that individuals generate content, right? User generate the content. When this data is uploaded to Facebook or other social media, parts of it become available to a lot of people, where, whereby the data obtains a more public character. The public availability of data can have advantages, of course, you know, new social relations, friendships, staying in touch, family, relatives, or distance, etc. And disadvantages such as job related discrimination. Um, one of the things that as you go forward from your degree and you know you hopefully go into the world of work eventually you know as long as we get over COVID some point in the future right um, your potential employers are going to be looking for you they're going to be searching you out they're going to be looking on Insta on Twitter on Facebook for you they're going to be seeing if there's any indiscretions that you've been up to which might not fit with their corporate image maybe if you're a problem on social media they may not be inclined to hire you this is just a normal part of everyday life now and this job based discrimination has been going on on social media for more than a decade i mean stalking is an even bigger problem right you can find people really really easily on social media it's not hard it's very very straightforward Criminal behavior like this is enabled when, this priv when privacy goes out of the window. So the private public relation also is another dimension on Facebook. The privately generated user data and the individual user become, the commodify uh, become commodified on Facebook. So that data is sold to advertising companies. So the targeted advertising is presented to users, etc., etc. I'm kind of repeating all this stuff, but you should be getting it by now. Facebook commodifies private data that is used for public communication in order to accumulate capital that is privately owned. And all users are excluded from this. So we are exploited for the creation of surplus value by the network. So Facebook is a huge advertising capital accumulation and user exploitation machine. Data surveillance is the means for Facebook's economic ends. Facebook only works as a company by surveilling us continually when we're using its platforms. It doesn't work otherwise. If, we, if it didn't work, Facebook wouldn't be a company. It wouldn't be big. It wouldn't be powerful. Zuckerberg wouldn't be able to go to you know, Congress and just face down you know, the American state like he can because his company's huge and he can't be controlled. So in terms of privacy, the intransparency of the company's use of personal data that is based on private appropriation of user data is the main form of privacy on Facebook. Facebook privacy is privacy for the company, not user privacy. So what I'm arguing here is Facebook protects its secrets with incredible gusto. You know, if you found out something about Facebook's algorithm, you know, if you find out something about Facebook's way of doing things, they would come after you with a million lawyers. It protects its own secrecy. It protects its own privacy incredibly. Now, a few years ago when I was writing a book on virtual reality, um, I got the chance to interview somebody from Facebook. Facebook own Oculus, who are the major company involved in um, domestic virtual reality, you know, home-based virtual reality. So I got to interview this guy. Can't tell you who it was. And... Um, when, when he got closer to our date, he, he sent me an email saying, look, um, there's going to be an issue here and you might have to interview me off the record. I was like, OK, uh, that's a bit of a problem for me because, you know, I, I had real questions that I wanted to ask. But can you tell me why? And he said, well, in order for me to go on the record, you'll have to go through Facebook's legal team. I said, well, I don't really see what the problem is. I, I mean, I'm happy to do that. And he said, well, it'll probably take about 18 months. I said, oh. OK, that's going to take a long time and uh, they'll want to do a thorough investigation into you as an individual. I was like, what? Like, yeah, well, you know, Facebook guards its secrets very, very closely. And if I'm talking to you as a researcher, not only do you need ethical clearance, but you will need legal clearance from Facebook. They will want to know that you are not a risk to them as a business. I was like, dude. 
let's just have a chat, right? And what happened was I did have a chat with this guy and it was off the record. Um, I used the ideas that we discussed about in the book. You know, I couldn't attribute them to this guy and, and I didn't quote anything. I didn't really, you know, I just took some sketchy notes when we were doing the chat together. We couldn't even call it an interview at that stage. But I was explicitly told, you know, Facebook are not going to let you you specky little researcher, you. Facebook are not going to let you anywhere near, even remotely near. And, you know, I wasn't even going to ask anything particularly secretive. You know, I was, but I also wasn't prepared to give up control of my research project, you know, my interview questions to Facebook so they could be legally vetted. And for Facebook's lawyers to investigate me as a private individual? I don't think so, dude. Facebook are all about privacy for themselves, but they are not about user privacy. So the prime oil for Facebook is the billions of identities they mine and get to know in ever greater detail. And they get to know in ever greater detail by the more we use their platforms. So the core of the business model is the easy access to that material. So if people make it clear with their clicks, likes and postings that they hate certain things and love other, love other things, these people are very, very easy to sell to. And really the core of that is that becomes more apparent and easier the more you use the platform. So if you use Facebook a lot, you are going to be great for them in terms of their business. Now, how can we theorize this sort of stuff? Well, we can look first of all to the great French uh, sociologist Michel Foucault. Michel Foucault argued the power is not only located in powerful bodies such as states or companies, Power produces reality. It produces the domains and object of objects and rituals of truth. The individual and the knowledge that may be gained of him belong to this production of reality. So what are we getting at you? Corporate uh, platforms owned by Facebook not only strongly mediate the cultural expressions of Internet users, but are involved in the creation of our reality itself. Facebook is such a powerful and ubiquitous tool that it is involved in the very creation of reality. Moving on to Gilles Deleuze, from the Panopticon to the Society of Control, big data systems such as Facebook greatly intensify the extent and frequency of monitoring of people, shifts the governmental logic from surveillance, looking at people, to what we call capture and control. If you can, if you can capture every bit of information, you no longer need to watch people. And this is a problem. Now, if you've watched um, The Social Dilemma, there's a really problematic part of that film, the Netflix from The Social Dilemma, right? Where it's like, you've got these guys sitting around in a room, literally looking at individual profiles on Facebook. That never happens. That, that is not part of what Facebook does, right? Facebook does not exert its power by observing us. It exerts its power by controlling us, okay? By having so much information about us that it can push us into particular actions and courses of actions over time. That's where, that's what real power is. Not being able to watch everyone, because Facebook literally doesn't watch. There's nobody doing the watching. There's no guy sitting there watching these things. It churns through data to be able to control. Much more powerful. So this is a shift from Foucault's notion of the disciplinary technology. And by disciplinary, Foucault means, you know, the kind of bureaucratic systems that are used to surveil us in everyday life, you know, like having a security guard around, for example, or having, you know, manuals that we have to follow or having, you know, books that we have to sign into when we enter a building. It's all bureaucracy, which is designed to make us think that there's somebody watching us at all times. No, no, no. In Deleuze's concept of technologies of control, there's nobody doing the watching. There's no thing watching us. Instead, huge amounts of information are being harvested on us to control our actions. And this is what Facebook really is all about. So Foucault's notion of discipline as a mode of power positions discipline as a machine that works on a societal level. So for Foucault, this produced power distributes individuals in a permanent and continuous field which they self-discipline. Self-discipline. The fear of thinking we're being watched or we could be being watched or we're being managed in some way, that's a self-disciplining field. It's like the idea that, you know, you best not when you're walking down the street, you know, and there's somebody really slow walking in front of me. You. You've had this, right? You know, there's people really slow. Has it ever occurred to you that you know, you're walking behind them and just really punch them in the back of the head. You know, just, just right in the back of the head, they'll, they'll go right down on the floor and you can get about your day, you know. 
but you don't do it. Don't do it, because what if somebody sees... Don't give me this moral argument, right? What if somebody sees me? What if there's a policeman around? <gasps> there's no policeman around. But it's, the, you know, a, a sort of a disciplinary machine engenders that kind of idea in us. Actively managing our behaviour to comply with expectations for fear of being caught. Always the fear of being caught makes us behave in particular ways. Fear of being caught transgressing and experiencing sanctions. Now, Foucault calls this the panopticon. Now, in the age of big data systems like Facebook, big data systems change the nature of observation through continual surveillance, constant surveillance, to this point to which there is no observation going on, it's just continual data churn, from a model where an observer is needed to one where observation can be distant and performed by software. And the nature of observation is not the same. A computer can't see you. Yeah, very important point here, you know. Computer doesn't have eyes, it can't see you. It, seeing is a human or animal activity. Computers aren't human or animals. So we come what we call the loses objectile. Not a subject itself, but a construct of patterns of code that emerge from activity in the digitally infused world. And power then comes through control of activity. So the data subject is a construct of all these patterns of code about us. Others have called this in different ways. So Lee Humphreys in her excellent book from 2018 calls it the quantified self. Social media are part of a long story of people cataloging in their lives and what we call media accounting. Uh, but the efficiency and economic factors of social media are what we need to pay attention to. Not necessarily the behaviour of cataloging our lives itself, which has been going on forever. People wrote diaries, etc., etc. People used to write letters and send to people. This has always happened. It's the efficiency and economics underpinning it that Lee Humphreys is calling into question and saying we need to pay attention. This kind of idea that Humphreys has that we need to look at this very closely resonates with what Nick Cernick calls platform economics. Now, Cernick's notion of platform capitalism is where capitalism itself is involved in a continual enrollment of new technologies, such as social media, to increase efficiencies and improve the process of capital accumulation. Now, the word social or social uh, associated with media implies the platforms are used are centered and they facilitate activities, just as the term participatory emphasizes human collaboration. Social media can be seen as online facilitators or enhancers of human networks, if we take Van Dyke's idea here. But as a result of the interconnection of platforms, a new, entirely new infrastructure has uh, emerged, an ecosystem of connective media with a few large and many small players creating platform sociality. And when we link that up with Cernex idea of this is a new mode of capitalism, which is involved in increasing the efficiency of capitalism by use of these platforms, this is what platformed economics, if you want, is or platform capitalism is. And as I've already said several times in these videos, that platform capitalism is heavily contingent on surveillance, capture of data and sale of us as data subjects to advertisers. All of this is underpinned by something we call the Californian ideology. So the disruption caused by these platforms in terms of privacy, dem democratic process, decision making, has often been conceptualized through this notion of um, the Californian ideology by Barbrook and Cameron. Now, Californian ideology is a weird amalgamation of two things which don't sound very alike to one another, but which are very, very similar. And you may well have encountered this in semester one if you did Reese's module on studying digital media. It has been thought of as the ideology of a techno elite in Silicon Valley, a radical mixture of libertarian and the radical politics of 60s counterculture. So what you have, 60s counterculture, you know, we stand against the big state. We don't want to get, you know, down with government, down with all this sort of stuff, mixed with a radical libertarianism, not a social sort of, um, an, an ideology that prioritizes people or, you know, benefits people in any way. But libertarianism in this sense would be, you know, I'm going to make loads of money, but I don't want to pay any taxes. If other people get hurt, it doesn't matter. It's all about me. This kind of libertarianism, right? So formulaically, the ideology can be suppressed as a combination of let me do what I want and don't tax me. 
<laughs> which kind of describes Facebook, Amazon, Google perfe perfectly, and especially the guys at the top. You know, I should be exempt from any kind of laws, and I don't want to pay tax either. So in practice, this ideology manifests itself in new forms, in forms of new media and the ownership models of new media. Vast profits are made from the exploitation of user-generated data with a business model that avoids corporate taxes and a social responsibility attitude that avoids accountability for the actions of any actor on those platforms. So when you have far-right lunatics plotting to murder the governor of um, Michigan during just before the US election in 2020, going on on Facebook, yeah, so what? What do, you, what do you want me to do about it? You own the platform, dude. Yeah, but it's not my problem. It's not my problem. Don't stand on me, man. Don't stand on me. This kind of madness ensues. So this ideological position on the operations of companies goes some way to explaining the vast data harassment platforms on, uh, on the Facebook platform, in light of the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Californian ideology does not emphasize always the brutal instrumentalism of these platforms in conceptualizing users. And what I mean by that is how these platforms think of us, okay? Because Facebook, Google, Twitter have boiled us down into units of economic value. Some of us are worth more than others, but we all have a price. This is how Facebook was able to determine how much it would pay for Instagram based on price per user. How much are we going to yield out of these people in terms of advertising money? And we are no longer thought of as people. We are thought of now as data subjects. That is why I'm going to continue using this term, data subjects. Data subjects have a price and a value. Human being has an intrinsic value. You can't buy me, man. You can't pay me off. Okay. Facebook's data subject has a value. And to hell with the consequences of this. How does this all fit together? Well, in terms of the attention economy, it fits together really, really well. So Andrew Keane, who's great, has been for many, many years on the attention economy. Notes that the problem with the digital community in general is dominated by a few companies, but critically, the medium of exchange between these companies is the attention economy. This economy is a product of, of the use of products of these dominant companies. Now, the attention economy is not a new idea. Gary Becker was arguing in 1965 that time, not material goods, is the key scarcity in modern society. The attention economy is based on that principle. They are all battling out for your eyes, what you're looking at and how long you're looking on it. And this becomes the key medium of exchange between these two different companies, you know, all these different companies that dominate things. So as long as they're all satisfied with the amount of the attention economy they, they have, nothing will change. Nobody is going to tip over Facebook. Nobody's going to tip over Google. Nobody's going to tip over Amazon. They're all satisfied with their place in the world because they dominate enough attention to keep themselves in, a, in the positions that they want to be. This is incredibly, incredibly dangerous because what we have are monopolies of power, which basically work in one another's interest to create a static system. You know, we haven't had a huge breakthrough in social media for a very long time. People say TikTok, but TikTok's got its own issues. And in, in terms of raw numbers, it's not it's still not that popular. You know, there's not been a new Facebook. I, I remember when Facebook first came big, People were just witnessing the end of MySpace as a social network. And people were saying, oh, Facebook, yeah, it's probably going to be around for like three, four years. And then something else will come along. This is the cycle that we saw at the time. And you had like Friendster onto Bebo, onto, you know, um, MySpace. These things last a couple of years and then they sort of fell over. Facebook's been incredibly resilient. Google's been around for 20 years. Nobody's close to challenging it. Amazon, more than 20 years, nobody's close to its domination of this model. So just as these things, you know, um, the attention economy, in the attention economy, we have a very, very settled way of doing things. Now, the attention economy itself leads to other problems with Facebook. So this is taken from Tania Bucher's excellent book, um, Then If, from 2018, the idea of A-B testing. And this is something uh, very sort of brutal and... Um, non-sophisticated form of psychological testing that goes on on Facebook all the time. So a fraction of users in A-B testing are diverted to a slightly different version of a page and their behavior is compared to an original group, a control group. If the behavior is better, i.e. 
more clicks, more likes, then the new version will replace the old version. And these experiments, these refinements are going on all the time on these platforms. They are experimenting with you to improve their products all the time. These invisible experiments become ubiquitous on the web. It informs the Facebook algorithm and tells Facebook about the emotions and helps create the, but most importantly, as Tanya says, helps create the emotions of users. Because if they flip this over, what Facebook are often doing is making you upset or angry. It wants to discover that kind of behavior too. And it is doing this all the time. Facebook is making its own users sad in order to improve how it sells things. Good, no? <laughs> now, as I said earlier, um, right at the beginning of all this, if you watch The Great Hack, that's a really, really good movie to watch. Um, Cambridge Analytica hacking scandal. Facebook sold and allowed access to millions of users to be selectively targeted with political messages prior to the two big 2016 elections. I recommend you watch this. What the great hack exposes and what Tanya Bucher's work um, exposes is that psychological operations or psyops are operations which convey selected information and indicators to audiences to influence their emotions, motives and objective reasoning and ultimately the behaviour of governments, organisations, groups and individuals. Cambridge Analytica did this in an incredible way, he used data to specifically identify undecided or manipulatable voters, then they bombard them with things all without the permission of the user, but facilitated by the architecture of Facebook. So this kind of psycho psychological game playing is going on all the time and it's it's happening all the time. It, 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 it's ubiquitous. It's, you know, Cambridge Analytica may have ended, but there are others in its place. Are we happy? I hope not. Okay. Facebook are evil. OK, the creation of and popularity of Facebook has created an entirely new mode of economic activity based on surveillance. The culture of sharing is effect effectively only a culture of commodity creation when the commodity is us and you are being sold to advertisers based on continual surveillance of your digital media usage. Yay, let's all log on to Instagram. See you guys in the next video.